Hi guys, welcome to Lila's Best Eats where I'm always doing it right. If you've already subscribed to my channel, thank you so much for your subscription. If you haven't yet subscribed, but you enjoy the content that I'm pushing out, then what are you waiting for? Don't be shy. Click that like, share, and subscribe. Tap that notification bell so you could be notified whenever I upload any of my delicious cooking content. Now, let's get into today's video. Let's get to doing what I do best. Let's get to doing it right. Okay guys, let's get to doing it right. Let me show you how to make these dairy-free Mexican cheddar biscuits. The ingredients you need are fresh chives, unsalted plant-based butter, dairy-free sour cream or regular sour cream, agave nectar or honey, black pepper, baking soda, baking powder, sea salt, distilled vinegar. Go check the description to see how I made the vegan buttermilk, all-purpose flour, unsweetened coconut milk, and non-dairy Mexican cheddar cheese. I've already taken the liberty to accurately measure the ingredients. So here I have measured a quarter teaspoon of baking soda, three quarter teaspoons of salt, a half teaspoon of black pepper, two cups of all purpose flour, two teaspoons of baking powder, a quarter cup of cold grated butter, a half cup of dairy free Mexican cheddar cheese, a third cup of finely minced chives, a half cup of dairy free sour cream, one cup of vegan buttermilk, and finally one tablespoon of agave nectar or honey. In the first step process of making these vegan Mexican cheddar biscuits, you'll work with only the dry ingredients first. So get the flour into a larger bowl, follow it by adding your salt, and then the remaining dry ingredients, your baking soda. And remember, it's imperative when baking, you guys, that you measure your ingredients accurately. Your baking powder, and finally, your black pepper. Okay, so now I'm gonna go ahead and use a whisk to aerate these ingredients. And by me doing this, it will make for a much fluffier biscuit. Next, add the cold grated plant-based butter directly into the flour mixture. And with either a blender cutter or two forks, cut the butter into the flour. Just be sure not to cut the butter to where it all disappears. Leave visual bits of butter because that's what's gonna help make the exterior of the biscuit that much more flakier. Once you finish completely cutting the butter into the flour, this is what your flour should look like. Your flour should look and have a slight crumbled texture to it. Next, add your dairy-free Mexican cheddar cheese. Then grab those finely minced chives and get those right into the bowl as well. And be sure to get all of your ingredients. Don't leave anything behind. Now, using a folding method, fold the cheese and chives into the flour, but do not overmix. It can cause the biscuits to be dense. In our second step process, we're going to be working with the wet ingredients. Start by adding your vegan buttermilk to the flour mixture. Then go ahead and add your dairy-free sour cream. And don't be shy. Scrape the remaining sour cream to make sure you get the correct measured amount into your bowl. And remember, accurate measurements are important when baking. Then lastly, add your agave nectar or your honey into the bowl with the other wet ingredients. Once you have added all of your wet ingredients, you can then begin to fold those wet ingredients into your dry ingredients. But remember to be mindful not to overmix the dough or you will end up with dense biscuits. Fold the wet ingredients into the flour just enough until the flour becomes moistened. Once you have finished folding the dough, this is what it should look like. And because this is a vegan dough, it will be just a little more stickier than a standard dough. Let me show you a quick Lila's Best Eats kitchen hack on how to make parchment paper lay flat. Place the parchment paper the short way onto the baking sheet, then fold the side of the parchment paper that curls and crease it against the side of the baking sheet. Apply that same fold and crease method of strategy to the opposing side of the baking sheet. And just like that, it lays flat. Next, spray some nonstick baking spray onto the parchment paper and either with a large spoon or an ice cream scooper like the one I'm using, begin scooping the dough onto the baking sheet. Be sure to leave about three to four inches in between each biscuit so when they bake, they don't become stuck together. Okay, we've gotten our biscuit dough onto the baking sheet. Now we can preheat the oven to 400 degrees and bake these biscuits for about 25 to 30 minutes depending on your oven. So get them into the oven, close the door, and when they're done, immediately slather some plant-based butter onto these hot, crispy, flaky biscuits and pair with your favorite entree or eat these delicious vegan Mexican cheddar biscuits all by themselves. Tell me you don't see it. I know you see it. 
You see how golden brown these biscuits are with the visual bits of cheese and chives. Let me not forget to mention how crispy these edges are too. Here, let me give you a close-up of this perfectly golden flaky buttery biscuit. Look at that golden brown bottom. But wait, listen to the sound of this crunchy exterior. And look, look how soft and fluffy that center is. If you enjoyed this video, subscribe, give it a thumbs up, leave a comment, share my content, let people know that Lila's Best Eats is always doing it right. Thanks again for watching. I appreciate your support and I'll see you next time. Welcome to Lila's Best Eats where I'm always doing it right. If you've already subscribed to my channel, thank you so much for your subscription. If you haven't yet subscribed, but you enjoy the content that I'm pushing out, then what are you waiting for? Don't be shy. Click that like, share, and subscribe. Tap that notification bell so you could be notified whenever I upload any of my delicious cooking content. Now, let's get into today's video. Let's get to doing what I do best. Let's get to doing it right. Okay, guys, let's get to doing it right. Let me show you how to make my chicken taquitos the Lila's Best Eats way. Grab you some cilantro, onion, two lemons, plant-based mozzarella or regular mozzarella, dairy-free sour cream or regular sour cream, olive oil, Chef Morito pollo seasoning or whatever pollo seasoning you prefer, low-sodium seasoned salt, chicken breast or chicken tenders, garlic powder, onion powder, black pepper, and some corn tortillas. Now, in this first step, get your olive oil, add about a tablespoon to a large pot with six cups of water, and bring it to a boil. Once the water has come to a boil, you can then add your chicken breast or your chicken tenders. Next, add a small amount of pollo seasoning, not too much, just enough to enhance the flavor of the water. Now, get the first lemon and squeeze the juice of that lemon directly into the boiling water along with the chicken and pollo seasoning. And don't worry if you get a few seeds in the water. We won't be using it for anything. Adding the juice of this lemon will not only enhance the flavor of the water, but it will also aid in assisting with the cooking process, which we need because we're going to slightly undercook the chicken to make it easier to shred. Once the chicken is done, we can begin shredding it. Now, the way I like to shred my chicken is, I like to call it the pinch and pull method. I like to start at the top of the chicken and pinch it, then pull it apart. And as long as your chicken is slightly undercooked, it will be easy to accomplish this method. But of course, if you have a method that works best for you, then please, by all means, apply that method. So now, all I'm going to do is continue to pinch and pull the chicken until we have all the chicken completely shredded. Then once the chicken is completely shredded, this is what it should look like. You should have perfectly juicy chicken shreds. In the next step, add about a tablespoon of olive oil to a 10-inch skillet over a medium-low heat. Then add the slightly undercooked shredded chicken to the hot oil so we can continue the cooking process. Okay, guys, now it's time to add the second lemon. Squeeze the juice of that lemon directly into the skillet with the chicken. Last time we did it to enhance the flavor of the water, but this time we're going to do it to enhance the flavor of our chicken. If you manage to accidentally drop a few seeds in the chicken while squeezing the lemon, go ahead and pick those out. We don't want to crack a tooth. And since we still have to finish cooking the chicken, be sure to get all the lemon juice into the skillet. It will help create a liquid that will help aid in the final process of cooking. Next, I'm going to add a small amount of Lori's low sodium seasoned salt, but not too much because as you guys know, I don't like to cook with a lot of salt. Then I'm going to add some Chef Morito pollo seasoning. I don't personally measure the seasonings in this particular recipe, you guys, because it's pretty much up to you to use as much or as little as you'd like. Next, add the garlic powder and feel free to be a little generous with it too, seeing how it doesn't contain any sodium. Then follow up by adding the onion powder, and you can also be generous with it because just like the garlic powder, it doesn't contain any sodium. Finally, add the black pepper, but be very careful not to add too much or you will end up with peppery chicken taquitos and we definitely don't want that. Once the chicken is seasoned, add a half cup of room temperature water to the skillet. Then begin to incorporate the seasonings and lemon juice into the chicken. But be mindful when you are incorporating the ingredients that you remove any lemon seeds that you may have missed when taking them out during the cooking process. If you find any seeds, pick them out, toss them in the trash, and continue to incorporate the seasonings. 
Once all of the seasonings have been incorporated, this is what the chicken should look like. You should have delicious, juicy, shredded chicken full of lots of seasoning and lots of lemon flavor. Okay guys, for this next step, you will need an eight inch skillet. And to that skillet, you will need to add a very shallow bath of olive oil. You will need to add just enough oil so that when you place the tortilla shell into the skillet, it becomes slightly submerged just like this. We are not going to fry the tortilla. We are just going to soften both sides so that it is easy to roll when we fill it with our shredded chicken. You will know exactly when the tortilla shell is completely softened because it should wiggle freely. Now, place the softened tortilla onto a paper plate with a paper towel to remove any excess oil and continue softening the remaining tortillas. Once we have softened all of the tortillas, we can then move on to filling them with the shredded chicken. Go ahead and get you a good amount of chicken onto the tortilla, but not too much. We're not making mini burritos. Place the chicken close to the edge of the tortilla towards you and begin rolling the taquito very gently. Start in the middle and work your way out to the edge. Once you have finished rolling the taquito, you should end up with the flap of the shell at the bottom just like you see here. See? Just like this. Here, let me show you again just in case you missed it. Place the chicken close to the edge towards you and begin rolling the taquito very gently. Start in the middle and work your way out. Once you have finished rolling the taquito, you should end up with the flap of the shell at the bottom just like the previous taquito we rolled. Before adding the taquitos to the preheated oil, be sure you place the taquito in the skillet with the flap down so as it cooks, it will seal so the chicken won't fall out. Do not overcrowd the skillet. We need to make sure that we leave enough space in between each taquito to ensure that each taquito achieves the crispy texture that I am looking for. So I am going to only add four taquitos to the skillet. Next, I'm just going to allow the taquitos to cook on each side for about two to three minutes or until they're golden brown. Then I'm going to give each taquito about a quarter turn so that I can continue to brown each side of the taquito shell evenly until I have all the taquitos completely golden brown. Okay guys, now that all the taquitos are brown, I'm just going to turn off the burner and remove them from the skillet. But take a look at this guys. You see that golden brown color? You see that crunchy shell? That's what you want to achieve. That's the ultimate goal here at Lila's Best Eats. Place the cooked taquitos onto a paper plate with a paper towel to allow any excess oil to drain off. Then pair with my homemade chunky guacamole or my homemade pico de gallo. Go check out those videos to see how I made those sides. If you enjoyed the video, hit that subscribe, give it a thumbs up, leave a comment, share my content, and let people know that Lila's Best Eats is always doing it right. Thanks again for your support. I greatly appreciate it, and I'll see you again next time. Everybody. Thank you for joining me today at Lila's Best Eats. I hope everyone's doing well. If you've already subscribed to my channel, thank you so much for your subscription. I greatly appreciate it. If you haven't yet subscribed, but you enjoy the content that I'm pushing out, then what are you waiting for? Don't be shy. Click that like, share, and subscribe. Tap that notification bell so you can be notified every time I upload any of my delicious cooking content. Now, let's get into today's video. Let's get to doing what I do best. Let's get to doing it right. All right, guys, let's get to doing it right. For my easy guacamole, you'll need three large Haas avocados, a half teaspoon and one tablespoon measuring spoon, some cilantro, red onion, garlic, lime, Roma tomatoes, black pepper, garlic powder, and sea salt. Okay, we need to get our avocados prepped for our guacamole. Using a sharp knife, let's first start by cutting all three avocados in half. Then, we'll remove the large seed from each of the sliced avocados. Once the seeds have been removed from all of the avocados, we can then use a large spoon to scoop the flesh out into a large bowl. To scoop out the flesh, just simply place the back of the spoon against the skin of the avocado, then rotate the spoon in between the flesh and the skin, and that's it. I'm just gonna continue removing the flesh from the remaining avocados, and then I'll be back to show you guys the next steps. 
All right, guys, let's get started with the next steps of making my easy guacamole. We're going to begin first with finely mincing both the leaves and the stems from this bunch of fresh cilantro. And whenever I use cilantro in any of my recipes, you guys, I always like to include the stems because that's where the pungent flavor profile of cilantro comes from. If you're someone who doesn't prefer a strong flavor of cilantro in your guacamole, then you can always feel free to omit the stems and just use only the leaves. After we're done mincing the cilantro, we can measure out three full tablespoons and add them directly into the bowl with the avocados. But be sure when you're measuring out the cilantro that you don't pack it into the measuring spoon, otherwise your measurements will not be accurate. Go ahead and measure out the final tablespoon and then we'll move on to mincing the red onion. Here's a helpful hint for those of you who get a little teary-eyed whenever you cut into an onion. Just simply chill the onion for about 30 minutes, then cut the onion in half, leaving the root intact, and that should help reduce those teary eyes. So let's go ahead and begin slicing a couple of slices of this red onion, about three to be exact. And then we can begin removing the outer layer and the first few layers, along with the white center part of the onion, before we commence to finally mincing this red onion, the same as we did with the cilantro. Stack the slices on top of one another, then cut the slices in half and begin the mincing process. Mince the red onion as finely as possible so you don't end up with chunky pieces in your guacamole. Then next, we're gonna measure out exactly three tablespoons of the finely minced onion and add it directly into the bowl with the other previous ingredients. And just like with the cilantro, you wanna make sure that you don't pack the onion into the measuring spoon because you wanna make sure you end up with accurate measurements. So measure out the final tablespoon and then we'll move on to the next step. Okay, next up are the two cloves of garlic. With a large knife and the heel of your hand, gently smash the garlic clove. By applying this method, it makes it much easier to remove the skin from the garlic. Apply this step to both cloves of garlic, and then once we have removed the skin, we'll move on to the mincing process. All right, now that we've removed the skin from both of our garlic cloves, we can begin our finely mincing process, just as we did with the cilantro and the red onion. We're gonna finely mince this garlic and get it right into the bowl along with the other ingredients. Finally, we can begin preparing our last vegetable for our guacamole, which are aroma tomatoes. To prep the tomatoes for dicing, simply cut all four sides of the tomato, then remove the flesh with either your knife or your finger. The reason we wanna remove the flesh is because we don't wanna end up with a watery guacamole. Okay guys, I'm gonna apply the same steps to the second tomato as I did with the first tomato, and I'm gonna cut all four sides and remove the flesh to ensure we don't end up with a watery guacamole. Then once I have removed the flesh from the second tomato, I'm gonna move on to the dicing process. Okay guys, now that we've removed the flesh from both tomatoes, we can go ahead and prepare to dice it. Cut the tomato lengthwise, then turn the tomato and begin to dice it. Dice the tomato not too large or too small. Make sure that you dice it large enough so that the bits of tomato can be seen throughout the guacamole. After you're done dicing the tomatoes, just dump them right into the bowl. And if you don't wanna use all the tomatoes, that's fine. Use whatever amount you prefer. Next, grab your lime and with the palm and heel of your hand, apply pressure and roll the lime back and forth several times to soften it. I find that when you apply this method, it not only softens the skin, but it also makes it much easier to squeeze out the juice. Then next, we're gonna slice the softened lime in half and squeeze the juice of that lime directly into the bowl with the other ingredients. The reason I didn't squeeze the juice into my hand to prevent any seeds from falling into the guacamole is simply because there weren't any seeds in the lime. So just be careful when you cut the lime to look for any seeds first. Okay guys, we're at the final stretch of making my easy guacamole. Let's first start off by measuring out a half teaspoon of sea salt and getting that right into the bowl. Then add a half a teaspoon of garlic powder. And finally, go ahead and sprinkle in some black pepper and that will complete the last of our seasonings. In this final step, I'm going to use my meat chopper to break down the avocados and blend my guacamole. And I chose this tool in particular, you guys, because it won't smash the avocados into mush. Instead, it will leave the guacamole with a more chunky texture, which I prefer. Then once you're done smashing all of the ingredients, this is how your guacamole should look. 
Pair the guacamole with your favorite chips and enjoy. If you enjoyed the video, subscribe, give it a thumbs up, leave a comment, share my content, let people know that Lila's Best Eats is always doing it right. Thanks again for watching. I appreciate your support and I'll see you again next time. Hi guys, welcome to Lila's Best Seats where I'm always doing it right. If you've already subscribed to my channel, thank you so much for your subscription. If you haven't yet subscribed, but you enjoy the content that I'm pushing out, then please don't be shy. Click that like, share, and subscribe. Tap that notification bell so you could be notified whenever I upload any of my delicious cooking content. Now, before I get into today's video, I want to give you a little back history on this recipe. Today's recipe are my sweet potato hash browns. And this particular recipe is a recipe that I created randomly in the kitchen one morning because I love potatoes so much, but because I suffer from gastrointestinal issues, it's hard for me to digest russet potatoes or red potatoes or certain potatoes. And so I had a bag of potatoes, but they were sweet potatoes. And so I decided that morning, uh, one morning that I was just going to wake up and say, hey, let me try to make these sweet potatoes, right? But I wasn't sure before applying this method if they would come out and be the same as regular standard hash brown potatoes because of the sugar content in them, right? Normal regular russet potatoes just have a high starch content. But with a sweet potato, you have to worry about the sugar content. And so after several trial and error, I finally got the recipe exactly the way I like it. And if you can accomplish this recipe, trust and believe, you're going to love it too. But yeah, so today's recipe is something very special to me. It's something very near and dear to my heart um, because like I said, I love potatoes so much, but unfortunately I can't consume them. And so I had to figure out a way how to continue to eat what I loved, but in a more healthier fashion. And so that's what this channel is about. I love to teach people how to eat good, healthy, nutritional food that's beneficial to the body. And, you know, it gives you what you need so that you can sustain throughout the day. So, without any further ado, let's get into today's video and let's get to doing what I do best. Let's get to doing it right. Hey guys, you know what time it is. Let's get to doing it right. Let me show you how to make my sweet potato hash browns. You will need one medium or two small sweet potatoes, a grater, sandwich bags, olive oil, sea salt, and black pepper. Before starting the peeling process, be sure to clean your potato either with fruit and vegetable spray and pat it dry or under cold water and pat it dry. Either way, clean the potato to remove any excess dirt, then choose to use either a large knife like I'm using or a potato peeler. I chose to use a large knife because it's comfortable in my hand and also because it covers a larger area of the potato, which makes for a much quicker peeling process. But you choose whatever works best for you. Once we have completed peeling the potato, grab your grater and use the side with the larger hose to shred the potato. What we are trying to achieve here in this step are long shreds of potato, not short shreds or pieces of potato. And the way to do that is by starting at the top of the grater using a one stroke motion. Then once you reach the bottom of the grater, remove the potato from the grater and start at the top again. If we consistently stroke the potato without removing it from the grater, you will end up with short shreds and pieces pieces and we don't want that. Our potato shreds should resemble the same look as regular hash brown potatoes. Be careful not to cut yourself on the grater as the potato gets smaller in size. When you're done shredding the potato, this is what the potato shreds should look like. They should be slightly thick and long. Okay guys, it's time to get your sandwich bag. Open it up and put a heaping handful of potatoes in it, roughly about one cup. Then we're going to add just a little bit of olive oil to the bag of potatoes. The reason we're doing this is so that the salt and pepper can adhere to the potatoes prior to cooking. Next, add about an eighth of a teaspoon of black pepper to the potatoes, followed by an eighth of a teaspoon of sea salt. Once we've added our salt and pepper, we can then close the sandwich bag and give these potatoes a very vigorous shaking to ensure that all the potato shreds are evenly coated with oil, salt, and pepper before moving on to the next step. So shake, 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 and let's move on. For the next process, you will need a 10 inch skillet and to that skillet, you will need to add a shallow bath of olive oil over a medium low heat. 
But don't overdo it, guys, and add too much. Add just enough so when you put the potatoes in, they become slightly submerged. In this next step, you will need to add half of the shredded potatoes to the preheated oil and begin making one even layer in the bottom of the skillet. The reason we want to make sure we evenly layer the potatoes is because we want to be able to allow the air to get in between the potatoes during the cooking process so that we end up with crunchy hash browns and not soft and soggy hash browns. If you noticed, when I initially put the potatoes in the hot oil, they had a dark orange color. But as the potatoes begin to cook, they went from a dark orange to a blanch orange, as you see now, and that's when you will need to make the first initial flip and apply the same method that we applied before and put the potatoes in one even layer. Once you have made the first initial flip, you cannot walk away from these potatoes. Since they have a high sugar content opposed to a russet or gold potato, they cook much faster and will burn much easier. So once you make that first initial turn, you will need to stay close by and do not walk away. I cannot stress this enough. As the potatoes cook and you continue to apply a flip and even layer method, you will begin to feel the crunch of the potato against the spatula. You will also see the color revert back to a dark orange once the potatoes are almost done cooking. When the potatoes become darker in color, you will need to apply the flip and even layer method more frequently to prevent the hash browns from burning. So as soon as you flip and lay them flat, you will need to immediately flip and lay them flat again and continue this process until the potatoes are lightly golden and crunchy. Once the potatoes are done cooking, I'm just going to take the spatula and press the potatoes against the side of the skillet. And because of the high sugar content in the potatoes, they're going to stick together. And then I'm just going to put them onto a paper plate with a paper towel to allow any excess oil to drain. And then I'll just continue to remove the remaining potatoes from the skillet, pressing them against the side and putting them onto a paper plate as well. You might want to use a slotted spatula for this because you don't want to pick up any excess oil. So I find that a slotted spatula like the one I'm using works best. Once the potatoes are done cooking, this is what they should look like. They should be light and golden in color. Set the potatoes to the side and allow the potatoes to cool for about three to five minutes. Doing this will make the potatoes become more crunchier because the sugar in them will react to the air. Next, add the remaining potatoes to the skillet to complete the cooking process. If you enjoyed the video, give it a thumbs up, subscribe, leave a comment, share my content, let people know that Lila's Best Eats is always doing it right. And once again, thank you for your support. I greatly appreciate it, and I'll see you guys again next time. everybody thank you for joining me today at Lila's Best Eats I hope everyone's having a good day if you've already subscribed to my channel thank you so much for your subscription if you haven't yet subscribed but you enjoy the content that I'm pushing out then please hit that like share and subscribe tap that notification bell so you could be notified whenever I upload any of my delicious cooking content now let's get into today's video let's get to doing what I do best let's get to doing it right okay guys let's get to doing it right for my dairy-free hamburger helper you're gonna need these ingredients ground turkey, onion, minced garlic, garlic powder, onion powder, paprika, black pepper, sea salt, parsley flakes, dairy-free cheddar cheese, corn starch, monk fruit sugar in the raw, cavatavi pasta or whatever pasta you like, olive oil, unsweetened coconut milk, and room temperature water. Now, for the very first step in making this dairy-free hamburger helper, you're going to need to slice off a few slices of the onion, about three to be exact. Then stack the onion, cut it in half, and commence to giving it a rough dicing. Once you've completed dicing the onion, go ahead and place it into a small bowl and set it aside for later. Okay, so we've cut our onion and diced it, and now we're going to move on to the dry ingredients. We're going to first start with measuring out one full tablespoon of paprika and getting it right into the small prep bowl. Then we're going to measure out one full tablespoon of cornstarch. And be sure that when you measure out the cornstarch, you level it off to make sure you have an accurate measurement. Okay, guys, these next few ingredients are going to require separate measurements. So we're going to start with the sea salt and measure out one and a half teaspoons, starting with the first teaspoon and then adding a half teaspoon to that. 
The onion powder and garlic powder are equal in measurements. We're gonna measure one and a half teaspoons of both, starting with the garlic powder. We're gonna measure out the first teaspoon, and then we're gonna follow it up by adding the half teaspoon. So we're gonna do the same with the onion powder. We're gonna measure out the first teaspoon, and then we're gonna follow it up by adding the additional half teaspoon. Next, we're gonna measure out exactly a half a teaspoon of our ground black pepper and get it right into the bowl with the other previous ingredients. Next, we're gonna grab our monk fruit sugar and we're gonna measure out exactly one full teaspoon. Then once we've gotten all of our seasonings added to this bowl, we're just gonna give it a light stir to incorporate all of the seasonings before we add it to the meat. Okay guys, we're down to our last dry ingredient. We're gonna measure out exactly three tablespoons of these parsley flakes and get it right into the bowl. And then we're gonna move on to the wet ingredients. For our first wet ingredient, we're gonna measure out one and a half cups of our unsweetened coconut milk. But if you prefer a creamier version, then measure out one and three quarter cups of unsweetened coconut milk and then pour that into a separate bowl and set it aside for later. Grab your pasta of choice and measure out exactly two full cups. Now using the same measuring cup, measure out two cups of your dairy-free cheddar cheese. Now it's time to prepare the meat mixture, but before we get started with that, we need to first measure out two cups of our room temperature water and get it into a medium saucepan over a medium low heat and allow it to slowly come to a boil. Now we can move on to the meat mixture. Go ahead and get your olive oil and measure out one tablespoon and get that into the skillet over a medium high heat. All right, you guys, here comes the fun easy part. Just go ahead and dump everything from this point moving forward, starting with the onions first. Dump those into the skillet, grab that garlic and open that top and dump about mm, roughly a tablespoon of that into the skillet as well. And go ahead and mix those onions and garlic. We're just gonna mix it thoroughly enough until the onions become translucent and we begin to smell the aromatics from the garlic. Now that our onions and garlic are done, we're gonna go ahead and add our one pound of ground turkey directly into the skillet. For our next dump and go step, we're gonna go ahead and get that seasoning that we prepared earlier in the video and dump it right on top of the meat. Next, using a fork or a meat chopper, incorporate all of the seasoning into the meat. We're gonna cook the meat for several minutes and allow it to brown. Then once our meat has completely cooked, we can then add our two cups of slowly boiled water directly into the skillet. Now for the few last remaining ingredients, we're gonna go ahead and add that one and a half cup of plant-based milk, followed by adding our two cups of cavitabi pasta. And we wanna make sure when we add the pasta, we wanna make sure that we slightly submerge it into the liquid and meat mixture so that when it cooks, it evenly cooks to an al dente texture. Place the lid onto the skillet and allow the pasta to cook for about 11 minutes. Once the pasta is done, remove the lid and add your two cups of dairy-free cheddar cheese. Lastly, go ahead and dump in those three tablespoons of parsley flakes and give this mixture a good stir until your parsley flakes, your cheese, and your milk are very well incorporated and you end up with a very, very cheesy mixture. Okay guys, once you've incorporated all of the ingredients, these are the cheesy results you should end up with. Do you see it? Look at it fall off the spoon. Look at all that cheesy goodness. If you enjoyed the video, subscribe, give it a thumbs up, leave a comment, share my content, let people know that Lila's Best Eats is always doing it right. Thanks again for watching. I appreciate your support and I'll see you guys again next time. Welcome to Lila's Best Eats, where I'm always doing it right. On this channel, I'll be showing you how to eat the food you love, but in a much healthier fashion and without compromising the integrity or the flavor of the food. So please, don't be shy. Click that like, share, and subscribe. Tap that notification bell, and you'll be notified whenever I upload any of my delicious cooking content. Now, without any further ado, let's get to doing what I do best. Let's jump right into this video, and let's get to doing it right. Okay guys, let's get into this dairy-free chicken pot pie recipe. These are the ingredients needed. You'll need bite-sized potatoes, fresh rosemary, thyme, sage, garlic, onion, plant-based butter, black pepper, garlic powder, parsley flakes, rotisserie chicken, and we're just gonna use the breast of the chicken only, frozen peas and carrots, celery, ready-made pie crust, low-sodium chicken broth, all-purpose flour, 
unsweetened coconut milk, and sea salt. Now, I've already measured everything out, and here I have measured two cups of chopped rotisserie chicken, breast only, one cup of frozen peas and carrots, two cups of cooked baby potatoes, egg washes, one egg to one tablespoon of room temperature water, one third cup of all-purpose flour, a half cup of diced celery, one teaspoon of finely chopped rosemary, two garlic cloves, finely minced, a half teaspoon of sage, one teaspoon of chopped thyme, one third cup of diced onion, a half teaspoon of sea salt, a quarter teaspoon of black pepper, one third cup of plant-based butter, one teaspoon of garlic powder, two third cups of dairy-free unsweetened coconut milk, one and three quarter cups of low sodium chicken broth, and two ready-made pie crust. All right, guys, let's get going. Let's go ahead and dump that plant-based butter right into that hot skillet and allow it to melt. Once the butter has completely melted, go ahead and toss in your diced onion, followed by your diced celery, and lastly, your finely minced garlic. Now, all we're gonna do is we're gonna cook these first three ingredients until our onion and our celery are softened and transparent, and we begin to smell the aromatics from the garlic. Then once we've accomplished that, we can go ahead and add in our sea salt, our black pepper, our garlic powder, and lastly, our flour. Okay guys, now with these ingredients, what we're gonna do is create our roux, just like you would for any good macaroni and cheese or gumbo. We're just gonna slowly whisk our flour into our fat, which is our plant-based butter. And we're just gonna whisk the flour well enough until it can no longer be seen and our mixture becomes more pasty-like. Then once we've achieved that, we can then go ahead and add in our low sodium chicken broth, followed by our unsweetened coconut milk, and then we're just gonna slowly whisk our liquid ingredients into our roux. We're gonna whisk the ingredients until we end up with a very creamy texture, and then that's gonna be the base for our chicken pot pie. Okay, so now our base is ready for our pie. Now let's go ahead and add all of our filling ingredients. Toss in your frozen peas and carrots, followed by your cooked baby potatoes, and then we're gonna toss in all of our fresh herbs. Get that sage in there, your chopped rosemary, and lastly, your thyme. Then go ahead and add a little parsley. It's totally up to you how much you use. You can use it or omit it, that's optional. Then we're gonna go ahead and add our main ingredient, our two cups of rotisserie chicken. Once we've gotten all of the ingredients into the skillet, we can slowly fold these ingredients together until they are well incorporated. This is gonna be our filling for our chicken pot pie. Now it's time for us to work with the pastry crust. So take one of the first pastry crusts and just unroll it onto a flat surface. I'm not using any flour or a rolling pin. The reason I'm not using a rolling pin is because I wanna manually stretch this dough into my pie pan. So what I'm gonna do is I'm just gonna go ahead and take this pie crust and I'm gonna place it into my pre-greased deep dish pie pan. And to manually stretch it, what I'm gonna do is I'm just gonna go ahead and pull on the sides of the crust all the way up to the edge of the pie pan. And I'm gonna apply this method around the entire pie pan. Then once I'm done manipulating this pie crust, we can move on to the next step. Okay, for this next step, you guys, we're just gonna take our liquid chicken pot pie filling and we're just gonna pour it directly into our deep dish pie pan. Be careful though, because this liquid mixture is still very hot. Then once we've gotten the mixture into our pie pan, we can then go ahead and lay the mixture into one even layer. And then once we've done that, we can work with the second pie crust and all we're gonna do is slowly unroll it and then we're just gonna lay it right over the top of our deep dish pie pan. If the edges are too long, you can feel free to trim them off. Let's get to sealing this pie. With your left index finger, apply it behind both pie crust and with your right thumb and your right index finger, gently press the pie crust over your left index finger to create a seal and an indention. Here, let me show you from this angle. Take your left index finger and with your right thumb and your right index finger, gently press the dough over the left index finger to create an indention. 
I'm just going to continue with this process until I have completed the entire pie, and then once I'm done, we'll move on to the next step. In this next step, with a small knife, we're just going to slice a few incisions in the top of our pie crust. The reason we're doing this is because we want to be able to allow the liquid mixture inside to be able to vent, and we want any steam that builds up to be able to escape. Now it's time to apply our egg wash. Apply a generous amount to the top, sides and edges of the pie crust. We're going to do this to ensure that we achieve a golden, shiny, flaky exterior once the pie is done baking. We're going to preheat the oven to 425 degrees and bake the pie at 350 degrees for about 35 to 45 minutes depending on your oven or until the pie crust is a golden brown. Then once the pie is done, you guys, this should be your end result. You should see a nice, golden, shiny, flaky exterior, and you should smell something so amazing that it makes you want to cut into this pie immediately. So how about we do that? How about we go ahead and just cut into this pie and see what this pie has to offer? Because the smell from this pie is definitely making me hungry. Yes, now that's what I'm talking about. Look at that chunky chicken and all those frozen peas and carrots. If you enjoyed this video, subscribe, give it a thumbs up, leave a comment, share my content, let people know Lila's Best Eats is always doing it right. Thanks for watching. I appreciate your support and I'll see you guys again next time. Lila's Best Eats where I'm always doing it right. On this channel I'll be showing you how to eat the foods you love but in a much healthier fashion and without compromising the integrity or the flavor of the food. So please don't be shy. Hit that like, share, and subscribe. Tap that notification bell so you can be notified whenever I upload any of my delicious cooking content. Now without any further ado let's get to doing what I do best. Let's get into this video and let's get to doing it right. Okay guys so in the first step of making the corn salad we're just going to go ahead and open this package so we can get to the corn on the top. And then all we're gonna do is we're gonna remove the corn, okay? Just like this. And then all we're gonna do is we're gonna just take the remaining corn, the unexposed corn, out of the husk. And all we wanna do is peel it away like this. Grab it, pull it. Peel it, grab it, and pull it and don't worry if you can't get all these hairs that you see eventually when you boil it those hairs will fall off most of them will fall off in the water when you boil it but try to remove as much as you can so I'm just gonna go ahead and continue to remove the remaining corn from these husks and then I'll be back okay guys now that we've gotten the corn dehusked we're gonna go ahead and get over here to the stove and put it into the boiling water. We're gonna allow it to boil for about 10 to 15 minutes. Okay guys, so now we're just gonna go ahead and add our corn of the cob directly into this boiling water. And like I said, we're just gonna allow it to boil for about 10 to 15 minutes. Okay guys, while the corn is over there boiling, I'm just gonna go ahead and get the onion prep. Go ahead and slice a few slices of onion. Now with this recipe, you guys, I don't measure the ingredients. I just go off of my preference of how much I like. You know, if you like a lot of onion, use a lot of onion. If you don't like garlic, you can omit it. Whatever you like or don't like, you can always use or omit. So let's just go ahead and get these little few slices of onion peeled so we can go ahead and get them sliced. And when you slice this onion, you want to make sure that you finely mince it, okay? Get it as small as you possibly can because you don't want to bite into large pieces of onion. Remember, this is a corn salad. It's not a main dish. So let's just go ahead and get this onion finely minced and then we'll move on to the next step. So for me, this will probably be all I would use because like I said, it's a corn salad. So the flavor of the onion is gonna come through regardless. 
because everything in here is just a vegetable. There's no meat or protein. So I'm just gonna use about this much for my four ears of corn. So that was about two large slices. So I would guess, roughly guess and say that this is about anywhere between two to three tablespoons of minced red onion. Okay guys, we've gotten the onion finely minced. Now it's time to move on to the garlic. So all we're gonna do is we're gonna take our knife, take a clove of garlic, take our knife, and with the palm of our hand, we're gonna give it a smash so that we can peel the shell of the garlic away. Apply the same method to the second piece of garlic so we can remove it from its shell. And then now we're just gonna go ahead and finely, finely mince our garlic, just like we did with the onion. But we want this to be much finer than that because garlic, of course, has a very pungent taste. So let's go ahead and get it sliced first. I like to slice it first. Then I like to turn a cat or corner and slice it. And repetitively go over it with your knife if you have to in order to get it as finely minced as possible. I'm only gonna use two cloves of garlic for this recipe. Okay, now that we've gotten our garlic finely minced, I'm gonna go ahead and set it to the side. So we can put it in a prep bowl and work on our cilantro. Okay guys, it's time to get our cilantro finely minced, just like our previous ingredients. So go ahead and roll the cilantro into a, a roll like that. And then just finely mince the cilantro. And just like with the garlic, you may have to repetitively go over it and over it to get it to the consistency that you want. Um, so yeah, I'm just gonna go ahead and finish mincing this and then I'll be back. Okay guys, our corn is done. So we're just gonna go ahead and get it right on to a plate so it can cool. So just remove the corn and put it onto a plate and allow it to cool. Okay guys, now it's time for us to prepare the corn. The first step of preparing the corn is to allow it to cool, of course, so you can touch it and handle it. But now we're just gonna go ahead and shave the kernels away from the cob. And we wanna get as close to the core of the corn as we can without actually cutting the core, okay? We don't want this part. So don't, you hear that? Don't cut that. Get as close as you can to that core and then just shave your kernels right off, just like that. Okay, that's all we wanna do. And I'm just gonna continue to get the, I'm gonna continue to do the remaining two corn and then I'll be back. Okay guys, we've gotten the corn done, we've gotten everything minced, and so now it's time to prepare the salad. So, what we need to do first, as you can see, the corn, once we sliced it off of the cob, it's still connected together. So what we need to do is we need to take a fork and we need to just gently break up the corn kernels so that they're separated, all right, before we can prepare the salad and add any of the other ingredients. So. I'm just gonna go ahead and break down these kernels for you really quick. All right, so we've gotten the kernels broken, separated from the cob. So 
So now we're just gonna go ahead and add our ingredients. We're gonna go ahead and toss in our onion. Toss in the cilantro. Now I'm gonna gauge it first before I just dump everything because I don't want too much. So I'm gonna use that much. And then if I need more, I'll go back and get the one, the cilantro in reserve. And then just go ahead and get the garlic in there. Okay. Go ahead and measure out two teaspoons, I'm sorry, two tablespoons of apple cider vinegar. It's one, two. We're gonna add equal measurements of olive oil. So two tablespoons of olive oil. Now we're gonna measure out a half a teaspoon of sea salt. Oops. And a quarter teaspoon of black pepper. And now we're just gonna incorporate these ingredients until they're all well integrated. And then we're just gonna refrigerate this overnight for best results. Okay guys, now we've gotten it all incorporated, our seasoning, so now we're just gonna go ahead and get it into the refrigerator. If you enjoyed the video, subscribe, give it a thumbs up, leave a comment, share my content, let people know that Lila's Best Eats is always doing it right. Thanks for watching. I appreciate your support and I'll see you guys again next time. Welcome to Lila's Best Seats, where I'm always doing it right. If you've already subscribed to my channel, thank you so much for your subscription. If you haven't yet subscribed, but you enjoy the content that I'm pushing out, then what are you waiting for? Hit that like, share, and subscribe. Tap that notification bell so you can be notified whenever I upload any of my delicious cooking content. Now, let's get into today's video. Let's get to doing what I do best. Let's get to doing it right. All right, guys, y'all already know what time it is, so let's get into this kitchen and let's get to doing it right. For my vegan frozen chocolate dip bananas, you're gonna need bamboo skewers, fresh ripe bananas, dairy-free vanilla bean ice cream, vegan chocolate sauce. Go check out my vegan waffle video to see how I made that. Walnuts, and of course, lastly, some cocktail peanuts, preferably salted. In the first step of preparing these bananas, you will need to use a small knife to slice the banana peel in order to remove the flesh of the banana. And I find that when I apply this method, I usually don't get those strings like I would if I had just peeled the banana the normal way. So go ahead and continue to get those bananas removed from the peel, and then we'll move on to the next step. For this next step, with your small knife, slice each banana in half, and don't worry about them being symmetrically the same in size. It doesn't make a difference. All right, guys, now that we've gotten the banana sliced in half, we can now begin to skew them with our bamboo skewers. And since we're working with ripe bananas, we really don't want to apply too much pressure or force when skewing the bananas because we don't want to break the banana in half. So what we're going to do is we're going to just carefully insert the bamboo skewer through the center of each one of the banana halves, and we're inserting it just far enough to support the weight of the banana so as we eat the banana, the banana doesn't break off the stick. Then once we've gotten all of the bananas skewed, we're gonna squeeze lemon juice over each one of the banana halves. And the reason we wanna do this is because we wanna prevent the bananas from oxidizing while they sit out or after we put them into the freezer. You know how when you cut an avocado in half, it begins to turn brown after a few minutes of sitting out? Well, that's because once the avocado has been cut, it exposes an enzyme in the avocado that turns the part of the avocado that was exposed to the air brown. So be sure to get a good amount of lemon juice onto these bananas before freezing them. Go ahead and place the bananas into the freezer and allow them to freeze for a minimum to a maximum of about four to six hours or until the bananas have become extremely solid. 
While the bananas are freezing, let's go ahead and get ready to smash our peanuts. Pour a good amount of nuts into a Ziploc bag. Pour just enough so after you smash them, you have enough to coat the bananas. Remove all the air from the bag before you begin the smashing process. Make one even layer of peanuts, zip the bag, then select a kitchen tool that you can use to smash the nuts. I couldn't find exactly what I was looking for today, so I chose to use my knife sharpening tool. Smash the nuts just enough until they resemble chopped peanuts. Then pour the nuts into a small bowl. Once we've gotten the nuts into the small bowl, this is what the nuts should look like. Set the nuts aside, get your walnuts, and apply the same exact steps as you did with the peanuts. The walnuts are going to be just a little bit easier to smash though because they are much larger than the peanuts and also because they're softer than the peanuts. So get them also into one flat even layer and commence to smashing them until they also resemble chopped walnuts. Okay, here comes the fun part, guys. It's time to dip the frozen banana into our dairy-free vanilla bean ice cream. But before we do, pour the ice cream into a very tall glass to make for easy, evenly dipping. I actually set my ice cream in the refrigerator overnight to allow it to naturally melt, and I did that so it would have a thick consistency to it. That way, when I dip the frozen banana to coat it, the ice cream should adhere to the banana much better without dripping off. So I'm just going to dip the banana and twirl it around a few times in the ice cream to ensure I have an even coat. And once I'm done, this is how the banana should look. Continue dipping the remaining bananas, applying the same step process until you have all the bananas coated. Try and be quick about it too so that ice cream doesn't melt off the bananas. It's okay if the ice cream melts just a bit because we still need to dip and freeze the bananas two more times. Once we have dipped the bananas three times and have allowed them to freeze, this is how they should look. They should have a thick coating of ice cream. The bottom of the bananas may not be completely coated and that's okay. That's because we allow the bananas to rest on the parchment paper. Okay, now I'm going to pour the cold chocolate sauce that I have from my vegan waffle video into a tall glass just like I did with the ice cream so I can easily and evenly dip my frozen coated banana into the vegan chocolate sauce to make sure I get a good even coating. The chocolate sauce won't have a thick consistency to it like the ice cream did though. You will have some residual runoff. So just allow the chocolate sauce to run off, but not completely, then place the banana onto the parchment paper. Continue dipping the remaining ice cream coated bananas into the vegan chocolate sauce until you have all the remaining bananas dipped and coated. Then we'll place them into the freezer and allow them to freeze for a few more hours before beginning our second dipping process. Now guys, the dipping process can be very time consuming and tedious, but if you just stick with it and apply these steps that I'm explaining to you in this video, I promise you, you're gonna love this cold, frozen, delicious treat, especially on those hot summer days. So let's continue this dipping process and let's get this last banana dipped into this vegan chocolate sauce so we can prepare to move on to our third and final step. This is the third and final dipping step for the bananas. And in this third and final step, we're just going to give each banana a final dip and allow any residual chocolate to drain off before we sprinkle them with our peanuts and walnuts. We want to be sure that the bananas are completely wet. That way, when we sprinkle the nuts on top, the nuts stick to the banana. Okay, guys. Now, in this final step, we're going to go ahead and sprinkle our peanuts onto these bananas. And because I like options when eating, I'm only going to sprinkle the peanuts onto the first two wet bananas. And then I'm going to alternate over to my walnuts and I'm going to sprinkle those onto the remaining two wet bananas. Because like I said, I don't like to eat the same thing over and over again. It becomes quite boring. So I like to have options. If you enjoyed the video, subscribe, give it a thumbs up, leave a comment, share my content, and let people know that Lila's Best Eats is always doing it right. Thanks again for watching. I appreciate your support, and I'll see you again next time.
everybody. Welcome to Lila's Best Eats, where I'm always doing it right. On this channel, I'll be showing you how to eat the food you love, but in a much healthier fashion and without compromising the integrity or the flavor of the food. So please, don't be shy. Click that like, share, and subscribe. Tap that notification bell so you could be notified whenever I upload any of my delicious cooking content. Now, without any further ado, let's get to doing what I do best. Let's get into this video and let's get to doing it right. Okay guys, let's get to doing it right. These are the ingredients you're gonna need to make my Asian lettuce wraps. I'll give you the full measurements of these ingredients in the next video clip. Okay guys, as promised, here are the ingredients you will need. You will need one tablespoon of minced garlic, two teaspoons of fresh minced ginger, two teaspoons of sesame oil, one tablespoon of low sodium soy sauce, two tablespoons of rice wine vinegar, two green onions chopped and divided, white and green, one red bell pepper finely chopped, one pound of ground chicken, one cup of water chestnuts, and salt and pepper to taste. Now it's time for us to prepare our meat mixture. So let's start first by adding our ground chicken to a larger bowl, then add our sea salt and black pepper directly to the ground chicken. Then follow that up by adding our finely minced ginger, our finely minced garlic, and then we're only gonna use the white part of the green onion and get that into the bowl, followed by our finely chopped red bell pepper. Then we're gonna add our soy sauce, our sesame oil, followed by our rice wine vinegar, and then last but not least, we're gonna add our water chestnuts. Now I'm just gonna grab my green onion and I'm gonna add about a handful to this mixture and then I'm gonna put the rest on reserve for later. Now that we've gotten all of our ingredients into the meat mixture, we can then go ahead and gently massage these ingredients to incorporate them into the meat. We don't wanna overwork the meat because unlike beef, chicken doesn't have a lot of fat and if you overwork it, you will melt the fat that it does have. Once we're done incorporating the ingredients into the ground chicken, this is what the result should look like. Your ground chicken should be moist and full of vibrant color. Here are the ingredients you're gonna need for the sauce. You're gonna need two tablespoons of rice wine vinegar, two teaspoons of monk fruit sugar, five tablespoons of low sodium soy sauce, two teaspoons of sesame oil, one teaspoon of cornstarch, and two tablespoons of hoisin sauce. Okay guys, now it's time for us to prepare our sauce. So let's get these ingredients into a larger bowl, starting with our five tablespoons of soy sauce first, then adding our two tablespoons of rice wine vinegar to that, followed by our two teaspoons of sesame oil. Then we're gonna add our two tablespoons of hoisin sauce. Now with the hoisin sauce, you may either need to use a whisk or a spoon to make sure you get all of that ingredient because it's kind of sticky. Then add your one teaspoon of cornstarch and then lastly, go ahead and add the two teaspoons of monk fruit sugar. Now, we're just gonna go ahead and use a whisk to incorporate all of these ingredients until they are well dissolved. Now it's time for us to begin the cooking process, but before we do, let's add one tablespoon of olive oil to a skillet over a medium high heat. Once the olive oil has reached its heated temperature, we can then add our marinated chicken meat mixture directly into the hot skillet and allow it to cook until it is completely browned. Once the meat mixture is done and has completely browned, we can then add our pre-made sauce and pour it all over the meat mixture. Okay guys, after we've poured the sauce into our meat mixture, we wanna make sure that we well incorporate that sauce into the meat. So be sure to mix the meat well and make sure that the meat is well coated with the sauce. Now go ahead and grab that green onion we had on reserve and dump it right into that meat mixture. And because we're using the green onion as a garnish, we don't necessarily need to cook it, so just lightly fold it into the mixture. Once the meat mixture is done cooking, this is what the end result should look like. You should have delicious, moist ground chicken with lots of flavor and beautiful, vibrant colors. Okay, guys, now it's time to go ahead and prepare the lettuce wraps. I already previously made some jasmine rice, and I'm just going to go ahead and add about two tablespoons or more to each one of the lettuce cups. I like to add rice to my lettuce cups because from the juice of the meat mixture, I like it to absorb in the rice because it adds an additional depth of flavor. But if you prefer not to add any rice, then that's your choice, you don't have to. So I'm just gonna go ahead and add some rice to this final lettuce cup, and then we're gonna move on to adding the meat mixture to the lettuce cups. 
Okay guys, now it's time to add the meat mixture to our lettuce cups. And just like with the jasmine rice, I'm only gonna add a few tablespoons per lettuce cup. I'm not adding much meat mixture to my lettuce cups because I did add jasmine rice and that's gonna make the lettuce cups more filling. But if you're a lot hungrier than I am, then feel free to add as much meat as you prefer. I'm just gonna go ahead and finish adding the rest of the meat and then I'll show you guys what the results should look like. Okay guys, here are the end results for the Asian lettuce wraps. If you enjoyed the video, subscribe, give it a thumbs up, leave a comment, share my content, let people know that Lila's Best Eats is always doing it right. Thanks again for watching. I appreciate the support and I'll see you again next time.